Oh my goodness, I'm taking a bath in potting media. Don't mind me. Hi everyone, it's Melissa, your Plantita Avogada here at Taste One Odes. Coming to you today with a comparison video. So if you found your way to this video, it's likely that you've bought one of these three plants and you're kind of unsure about the identification, the ID that was given to you, or maybe you're just looking for care tips. Well, you're in luck because I have all of that for you here today. Before we get started though, let me go ahead and jump into my three disclaimers. One, KKB tayo, kanya kanyang bayad. Plantita Abogada has to make sure that you guys know we each pay our own way. So anything I show you here today, you know, that's well and great. If you get one, make sure it's within the budget and we don't break the bank buying one, okay? Two, I'm not an expert. I am an attorney by profession. I am not a botanist or, you know, a horticulturalist. I'm just a plant hobbyist like you guys. So when I do provide you any facts, I'll be sure to put the source on the screen as well as in the description box down below. Number three, because I'm not an expert, I can't guarantee that the care tips I share with you will apply to your area. We do have different microclimates and different growing conditions. So I would suggest that you find someone in your area who has one of these plants, who's grown it successfully, um, or who's grown it, you know, failingly, I guess. The point is, you find someone in your area who, who has this plant who can give you tips on how to make it thrive in your care, maybe even provide you with pricing and where to find it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and with that, we've got all of that out of the way. This episode will be dealing with the Raphidophora cryptantha, the Monstera dubia, and Caribus, the shield jewel orchids. So let's start with this plant the Monstera dubia. According to Royal Botanic Gardens Q, it is a native of Chiapas, Mexico, all the way to South America and Trinidad. Q does note that it is a climber and lives in a tropical wet biome, I believe. The Monstera dubia I have was propagated last year. I kept it in PAFCAL. I did not give it anything to climb purposely. Um, it's doing great, great roots in here. And as you can tell, it's super long, but I did not give it anything to climb just for this video, just so that we could discuss this really, really important um, aspect of its ontogeny. And if you remember that word, you know that ontogeny refers to the growth of a plant from being a juvenile to its intermediate phases towards maturity. So it's the growth of a plant. With this guy, because it is a viner, it'll keep going and going and going until you find, until it finds some place to climb on. The younger leaves are a dark green with silver patches on it. The veins appear dark green, as you could see here. And I'll go ahead and put a close up on the side of the screen. It is just gorgeous. You do have aerial roots that appear under each node. And if you allow this thing to climb, it'll climb and, you know, I don't like using the word shingle because to me and to Merriam-Webster, shingling is the act of um, something that overlaps, right? So you've got leaf on top of leaf, on top of leaf, on top of leaf, kind of like the um, clay roofing. Oh gosh, the name is on the tip of my tongue and I can't think of it. But anyway, so you've got them on top of each other, right? Shingling. So that's in my mind what shingling refers to. And this guy doesn't so much shingle as it does climb. So that's why I, I don't like referring to it as a shingler. And I kind of agree with Q when it says that it's more of a climber. Anyway, the thing with Monstera dubia and the reason I kept it in this container for a really long time is because as it matures, it starts to lose its silver patches. So bigger leaves like this one that just came from this mature stem right here is a lot more green than it is silver. And you can see that here between these two leaves added on. And then let's pull out a younger leaf and oh yeah, big difference in the amount of silver that is on this leaf. The nice surprise about this guy 
you know, referring to ontogeny, which if you guys have seen my past videos, is really important in the lifespan of an aeroid, especially, because not everything is what it seems like. These guys are transformers, you know, what is it? More than meets the eye, <laughs> there you go. So with these guys, if you give them something to climb, which I purposely did not do here, the leaves will get bigger, will lose the patterns, will get darker, will become glossier. So this is matte right now, but it'll become glossier and it will actually change its shape and fenestrate. It's just an amazing plant. It's stunning as a juvenile plant. You know what, I'll go ahead and flash on the screen video that I took this morning of Ardubia. The mother plant of this guy is actually climbing on a tree. And we decided to do that after it ran out of space on its pole and started giving out smaller leaves. So if you give it something to climb, it'll keep producing these bigger and bigger leaves. And I mean, these guys are nothing compared to the size of those giant leaves, just, just magnificent. So regardless of maturity, the Monstera dubia leaves will always be facing, will always be downward facing. Um, yes, downward facing. And down, 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 down. So that's the thing. Even here, we have them growing down. This guy's kind of sideways, but everybody after that is growing down, 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 down. Another interesting thing is that they alternate. This one grew to the left. This one grew to the right. This one grew to the left, to the right again, so on and so forth. You could see it throughout the leaf. They alternate in the direction that they grow. They're all growing downward facing, but I mean, on which side that they grow. So the Monstera dubia flowers appear to be like most Monstera flowers where it's got that outer shell. Can't remember what it's called. I'll go ahead and find it and put it on the screen for you. And it's got that spathe. And I mean, I looked it up online. It seems a little unremarkable. I have my Monstera mother plant Oh, and this guy in um, indirect sunlight, I suppose. This guy's growing in the potting shed, so he has a translucent roof on the potting shed. The mother plant is growing on a tree, so she has dappled sunlight at its highest amount of light, shaded at her lowest amount of light. The mix that I normally have, that I have my mother plant in, is an aeroid mix, so that it's really well draining. This is in PAFCAL and it does just as well in PAFCAL. Watering is just like any other aeroid. However you water your aeroids, that's how you should water these guys. That's why I'm not going to give you direct instructions on watering is because I'm now entering the summer season here in the Philippines. It begins in March and it goes all the way through May or June and they are sweltering months here and we water every day. Last year we had some instances where we had to water twice a day. The leaves are already starting to burn here, so it's only February and we are watering every day. <laughs> so it, whichever way you water your aeroids at home and whichever way they're happy, these guys will do well with. They are super easy and you won't have a problem with them at all. So I covered lighting, water, and media for these guys. So if you like the look of Anthurium regales, because this is what the Monstera dubia and these guys all remind me of, are mini Anthurium regales. I would definitely recommend these guys. However, because the Monstera dubia does get enormous, the leaves get enormous, I would suggest that you stick with either of these two if you don't have much space. And let me go ahead and start with this guy. So this is the Rifidophora cryptantha. It is a native of Papua New Guinea, according to Royal Botanic Gardens at Kew. It is a shingler climber, and it grows in a wet tropical biome. We visited at the May Tolentino's garden. If you haven't seen that video, I'll go ahead and put a link to the video here on the screen. But she had poles of Rifidophora cryptantha. Like poles, six foot high poles about. I know it was about my height. It was overwhelming because they were all around the poles and they were along the walls too in this one area. And I hadn't gotten one because it looks like a immature dubia and I wasn't ready to have a duplicate of the same kind of plant. So when I saw it, I was just like, oh my goodness, oh my gosh, I want one. And she snapped 
<laughs> she snapped the vine off and is like, here you go. You could go ahead and root this. And we did. And yay. So we've got some beautiful roots. I can see through this pot and got some roots on the bottom. Gonna have to pot this in the ground soon, but I saved it in this pot just for this video. We're gonna put it alongside the walls so that it sticks out even more, the green against the white. I mean, can you see that? It's gonna be gorgeous. So these guys, these are more shinglers to me than the dubia is. The dubia, I believe the dubia could probably be a shingler if given too much light. When that happens, the nodes don't tend to reach out as far because they don't need to get light. The light's coming to them, so it tends to have smaller nodes. But this guy, this guy has smaller nodes no matter what I do. And as you can see at the bottom part of the plant, the leaves are all kind of overlapping each other, just like those roofs um, of those Spanish style homes that I mentioned to you earlier. The Rifidophora cryptantha. The leaves don't get as enormous as Monstera dubia. In fact, you know, when I said that they were enormous for Ateme, we've got some big leaves down here, but they don't get to the size of Dubia, it gets huge, huge leaves. These guys tend to stay on the smaller side. They tend to shingle. They're probably a good alternative for ivy if you're looking for a shingling plant on a wall or on a slab of driftwood or on whatever you want it to climb. It's gorgeous. The leaves are rubbery to the touch. Um, almost velvety like flocked it's flocked i'm not saying the bad word guys i'm saying flocked f-l-o-c-k-e-d so kind of like flocked and velvet you know those toys that have the velvety feel but the pile is so short that you could just feel it you can't see it that's right that's what rifidophora cryptantha feels like it has these beautiful dark green leaves that show these gorgeous white veins throughout there is no obvious margin on the leaves themselves, as you can tell right here with this guy, but it's a stunner nonetheless. The Cryptanthus flower is kind of nondescript as well. Um, you know, they had a picture of it. I haven't seen one in real life, obviously, but they have a picture of it on Royal Botanic Gardens Q. And it actually, what's interesting about it is that they show up behind the leaves and that's another thing, I think that's probably why I've never noticed one in real life, is that they show up behind the leaves. They don't show up, you know, they don't become very obvious at all. But it's pretty cool. It's a nondescript, but pretty cool feature of the cryptantha. So our Rifidophora cryptantha grows in our greenhouse right now under a 70% shade net. It is in a mixture of cocoa peat, some carbonized rice hull, some small pumice, the really, really small pumice, not the bigger kinds. I'm talking about, I don't know what's smaller than mungo, guys, oh, for viewers in the Philippines. I don't know what's smaller than mungo, but we got that in this. And I see, I do see some rice hull as well, some dried rice hull. So that's what we got this guy growing in, and he's just doing superbly. He gets watered along with the other aeroids, so at this point it's every day because it's so hot. During the rainy season, we don't have winter or fall here. During the rainy season, it gets watered maybe every two days, every three days. Sometimes we don't water because it, it's the rainy season. But yeah, it'll do fine on the same watering schedule as this and as with your other aeroids. Another interesting fact about this guy is that these leaves all grow upward. Up, 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 up. Yes, they all grow upward. And let's go ahead and do a comparison with this guy. This is in comparison, I don't want to break any leaves, so give me a second. This is in comparison to the Monstera dubia, whose leaves grow facing downwards, right? I know, I'm looking at this, I'm like, what are you doing? Why are you sideways? But whatever, you know, they grow downwards. So that's another tip to remember when trying to identify whether it's a cryptantha or a dubia is that <laughs> is that dubias have leaves that grow downward facing 
and cryptanthus have leaves that grow upward facing. And that, my friends, is the Rufidophora cryptantha. Now, the last plant on our list is a Caribus. And I say a Caribus because I'm not quite sure of the identification on this one. I know it's a Caribus. It is unmistakable. And I just don't want to take the chance on identifying which species it is. So Caribus, according to Royal Botanic Garden Q, are natives of Malaysia. So we've got Indonesia in there. We've got Malaysia, the Philippines whole bunch of countries on the bottom of Asia. So Southeast Asia area, the watery area, tropical area, I guess. But these guys, let me get my little plate, okay, are not aeroids. These guys are actually orchids. So if you look at these leaves, it looks very, very similar to these two. I mean, it's got the dark green leaves. It's got the, let me see if I can open this actually. I keep the tape on the side so that the toddler does not get into mommy's plants because he's getting into everything right now. Oh my goodness, everything. So the person I got it from, Unfurling Nest, friends of ours, Jed and Blance, they actually call this plant <laughs> finicky AF. If you know what that means, you know. Anyhow, that's why it's kept in a dome, is because it requires higher humidity than these two. It is a geophyte, according to Q. I believe they called it a tuberous geophyte. And I've seen some Caribus species that actually grow along rocky terrain, so along rock walls and the, and the like. So it seems like it is used to having a lot of water around it. And let me see if I can zoom in for you. There's that precious. I will be moving this guy into a terrarium shortly, but it is exquisite. Now, with this plant, I already mentioned what the leaves look like. It looks like these two, dark green with white, um, with white veins on it, right? So it would look more like this guy, actually, than this guy, because this guy is silver patches. But what differentiates this, the Raphidophora cryptantha, from the Cariba, Caribus, is that the Caribus has white veins that kind of form margins. So you've got this heart in the middle, and then you've got another heart on the outside of it, and it, it, it's very um, hearty. <laughs> for lack of a better term, I'll go ahead and put a picture on the side of the screen for you so you can see what I'm talking about. I'll put a picture of these three side by side on my Facebook page along with the differences so that you could compare them for yourselves. But it is a stunning plant. What I am most excited about this plant are its flowers. So the flower, the picture of the flower that my friend um, at Unfurling Nest sent of this beautiful deep maroon or deep red velvety orchid with white on it and it has this little crown this little crown on the back of its head and it's just a stunning stunning orchid so inside this pot are actually tubers because it is finicky right <laughs> and i see a tuber right here i needed a plate just to make sure i don't lose anything but I don't want to move anything else until I move them into a terrarium. This, my friends, is its tuber. So unlike other orchids that actually have those beautiful fat leaves, like the Phalaenopsis, I hope I pronounced that right. Unlike those guys, these guys are tuberous. So being geophytes, it is important for them to have ground to grow, grow in, right? I suspect these guys might be lithophytes too, just because of the rock aspect. But I'm not the expert here. And I will choose to listen to the experts where it comes to these finicky, <laughs> finicky orchids who must live in terrariums because they will not survive my tropical savanna microclimate. Anyway, wish me luck with this plant. Since it is new to me, I do not have any care tips to provide. I will be in the same boat as you guys, and we shall be sharing tips if you guys have one. 
Ooh, but if you have grown some of these successfully, please do share your comments in the comment section down below. I would love to hear what you've done. So maybe I could get some inspiration on how to treat these guys. So to recap, we have the Monstera dubia, which is a dark leafed plant with silver patches on it. The leaves grow in a downward fashion from the center, downwards, downwards, because they're not both on the same, anyway, yeah, so alternating, downwards, right? Then these leaves actually go through some ontogeny and change from these little juvenile baby leaves to these massive, glossy, fenestrated leaves. It's like, who are you? I mean, quite the glow up, really, if you think about it. Anyway, so it does that when it matures. So those are the three key characteristics that differentiates the Monstera dubia from these two, is one, juvenile leaves are silver patches on a dark green background. Two, it is it grows downward facing. Three, it actually will change how it appears. In the leaf shape, the texture will change once it is allowed to climb and mature. It will even fenestrate, shocker. So those three characteristics belong to the Monstera dubia. The Raphidophora cryptantha is also a dark leaf plant. However, it does not have silver patches. It has white veins on it. Also, the Raphidophora cryptantha, instead of growing downward like the Monstera dubia does, it actually grows upwards. You know, upwards, up, yay, as you can see here. Both of these guys are aeroids. This guy is not an aeroid, and that's its main distinction from these two, is that it is an orchid. So, aside from being an orchid, it also grows out of a tuber. It does have dark green leaves with white veins, similar to the cryptantha, but the veins also make like a margin around the leaf, whereas the cryptantha does not. It just ends where the leaf ends as well, the vein, veins do at least. And then finally, the flower for the Caribus species, at least this one in particular, is a dark red velvet, beautiful flower. The flower for the Monstera dubia appears to be a white shell with a white spathe. I think that's what it looks like, if I remember correctly. The Cryptantha, I have not seen one before, but Royal Botanic Garden Q has a flower of it, and it actually grows under the leaf, so it's not very obvious. And that, my friends, is it. If you enjoyed this video, please feel free to give it a like, subscribe to my channel for more content that comes up. Oh yeah, um, don't forget to turn on that notification bell just so that you don't miss that content that I was just talking about. If you miss me during the week or if you want to see a visual of this video, a visual of the differences of this video, feel free to check me out on Facebook. I am there as Tasteful Nodes. And finally, if you're just bored and just want to look at pretty pictures, I am on Instagram as Tasteful Nodes as well. Check me out there. Okay, guys, until next time, sa'u'ulitin, keep your nodes classy and tasteful. Bye.